All right, let's uh, bring the meeting to order. Uh, Environment Sustainability Committee meeting. Decorate, any decorates or conflicts of interest? No, Seeing not none. for me. Can I have approval of the agenda? I have a mover and a seconder. Trevor moves. Your Worship? Sure. Bob, you're on the line? Yes, I am. Good, okay. Approval of the minutes from January 18th, 2023. Sure. Trevor moves. Bobby seconds. Okay. Report sustainable procurement presentation by Reeve Consulting. Who's taking the lead on that? Katrina. Yes, right this on. is mine. Okay, Katrina. Um, so, as you've probably, many of you, been told before, we've been working with Reeve Consulting, um, our department, finance department, as well as the town of Stratford for about a year, I would say, maybe not quite. Um, and they've been working with us to put together a sustainable procurement action plan and some tools um, and to do some training. So, um, we're lucky to have them here today to do a bit of a presentation on that action plan for you. Um, they are well versed with our municipality. We've been a member of the Canadian Collaboration for Sustainable Procurement for a couple of years and um, they are the managers of that program. Um, so today we have um, Marin and Amanda from Reeve Consulting to tell you a bit about the project we've been working on. Perfect. Okay. Should we jump in? Yeah, go ahead, Marion. Marion and Amanda, Thank you. welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, great to be here virtually. Um, so thank you, Katrina, for that intro. Uh, my name is Marin Shields Brown, and I'm a sustainable procurement consultant on the team with Reeve Consulting here, based out on Canada's west coast uh, in Vancouver, BC. And I've been the project manager for this initiative with the city, uh, working alongside my colleague, Amanda. Uh, and so before I dig into uh, our agenda for the presentation today, uh, I'll just hand off to my colleague, Amanda, to jump in and introduce herself. Thanks, Marin. Um, I also just wanted to take a moment to ensure that everyone can hear and see us all right. Um, we were having a little bit of technical issues on our end, but can everyone hear and see us okay? Yes, uh, yes coming in clear. Okay, yeah, perfect. perfect. So we'll carry on. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm Amanda Schwenard, um, project advisor on the team, um, uh, working with Marin and uh, Katrina on this project. And I'm also the program manager of the program, the Canadian Collaboration for Sustainable Procurement, um, or the CCSP for short. So um, definitely have some familiarity with the city of Charlottetown and your sustainable procurement efforts to date. And I'm really looking forward to presenting today. Perfect. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so the purpose of our presentation today uh, is really to provide an overview of Charlottetown's uh, sustainable procurement strategy and action plan, which serves as a guide for building and optimizing a high impact program. And the document is comprised of two components. And so for our first agenda item, we'll be covering the strategy section, which really outlines the approach that Charlottetown will follow. And so that includes a vision, goals, and program framework. And in agenda item two, uh, we'll cover the action plan, which is essentially a roadmap of activities spanning the next five years, including a detailed year one work plan uh, and key performance indicators to measure progress. And we will be closing out our presentation today by taking a quick step out of the strategy and action plan itself to discuss some of the budgeting and cost implications of sustainable procurement as, you know, this is a really critical piece in developing a fulsome understanding of the concept and how it will benefit the city. And so ultimately, we want all of you to come away from today's session with a sense of confidence and support around the proposed strategy roadmap of activities in the action plan, uh, as well as a good understanding of the cost implications uh, of sustainable procurement when considering a best value approach. Um, and so just before diving into the session, I'll um, pause there if there are any questions um, or concerns. No, nope, sounds good. Anybody have any questions? No, nope, looking forward to it. Okay, excellent, thank you. So to kick off the presentation, uh, we'll do a little bit of unpacking of that strategy section, which again, just really provides an overview of Charlottetown's approach for sustainable procurement over the next five years. 
So definition wise, sustainable procurement really embeds relevant sustainability considerations into processes for selecting goods and services alongside traditional considerations like price, quality, service and technical specifications. It's a broad umbrella term under which most sustainability issues that relate to procurement can be nested. And so in terms of defining those different sustainability issues, the four pillars or subcategories shown on the screen establish a common language and a clear understanding of the scope of influence that sustainable procurement has within the marketplace. Uh, and so environmental, social, ethical, and of course, economic, they're, you know, representing that combination of price factor in the decision making process. So environmental priorities can look like reducing greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption, advancing waste reduction and diversion, as well as considerations around full life cycle for products and services. Social pillar priorities can include advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and workforce diversity, targeting underrepresented groups through procurement, whether, you know, that's minority-owned businesses, social enterprises, or even, you know, looking to procure from more local suppliers, however the city wishes to define local. And the ethical pillar really represents more responsible supply chain practices, and so ensuring no forced labor or child labor, uh, and enhancing due diligence around suppliers' health and safety practices. And I will just add there as well that under Charlottetown's model, the economic pillar really represents that combined prioritization of price with the environmental, social, and ethical considerations I just mentioned, um, you know, to ultimately derive best value for the city. We want to acknowledge so, that- you know, Marion? Oh, for sure. Can you just give me some more examples on the environmental part of it? Would the that be also, like, for example, like vehicle purchases? whether they're electric or hybrid or, or diesel or gas? Yes, exactly, okay. for sure. Okay. So energy efficiency within vehicles, definitely. Um, and within the strategy and action plan, there is a more fulsome list of what uh, Charlottetown's defined environmental priorities are. Perfect, okay, thanks. Excellent. Um, so we want to acknowledge that, you know, as you're starting to think about this whole sustainable procurement program, it really is an enabling strategy that aligns with and supports Charlottetown's existing long-term plans and strategies related to uh, sustainability and community development, such as the Integrated Community Sustainability Plan. Um, and a common misconception, you know, is that sustainable procurement is a standalone initiative and a separate priority, if you will. And so, um, you know, in essence, it really is a driving mechanism behind all those other sustainability priorities like reducing greenhouse gas emissions or prioritizing more zero emissions fleet vehicles and the like. And so when an organization or a municipality buys does say a lot about it. And so embodying Charlottetown's top level sustainability priorities into the way that the municipality purchases goods and services is really helping advance progress towards those sustainability goals. So Charlottetown's program has been built upon this 10-point uh, best practice framework for a high-performing sustainable procurement program. And the framework has been developed and refined over the last 10 to 15 years by the Canadian Collaboration for Sustainable Procurement, or CCSP, uh, of which Charlottetown is a member uh, that Katrina had mentioned at the top of the session. And the strategy and action plan really lays out a roadmap of how the city will progress towards advanced maturity in all of these program areas, taking an iterative approach, of course, and, you know, focusing on a few elements uh, during the first year of program activity, which we will touch on a little bit later. And so I'll just pause here uh, to define that acronym on the bottom left there, HIPO, uh, that stands for High Impact Procurement Opportunities. And so these are, you know, the 10, top 10 to 15 commodity categories that uh, have been pre-identified at the city is, you know, having a really significant sustainability risk or opportunity. And so that's really where Charlottetown is going to start doing the doing, uh, if you will. And so, you know, either that's getting more sustainability criteria into issued bids or inserting additional considerations into contracts that are up for renewal or, you know, even engaging with an existing supplier to discuss how their practices are aligning with the city's sustainability goals. 
And so, you know, the ultimate goal over the next five years as laid out in the strategy is to continue developing and maturing those other nine elements uh, in Charlottetown's best practice framework, whilst taking action simultaneously on key hippos that are passing by. So, you know, really taking a two track approach, if you will. Uh, and we're big on planning at Reeve and, you know, we can't understate the importance of developing plans and strategies and policies, but we're also really big on doing. And, you know, hippos are really where the rubber hits the road in terms of Charlottetown actually getting going on uh, doing and practicing sustainable procurement. So within that, we want to iterate as well that sustainable procurement activity will take place at various levels of spend, whether that be more low dollar value P-card purchasing, uh, competitive bidding processes like public tenders and RFPs, as well as within large multi-million dollar capital projects. And so there is an opportunity uh, at all you know, levels of spend and regardless of dollar value, the impact can be significant. So even for low value purchases, you know, those can often be those low hanging fruit to get started started with. And so that's a very, you know, quick rundown of the strategy section of the, the strategy and action plan. And so uh, I'll pause there if there are any questions once again, um, before I dive into the action plan, which is really that roadmap of activities uh, and groups responsible for those activities. Anybody get any questions? Anybody? Bob? And uh, I will mention as well that we'll have lots of time at the end um, for a more uh, comprehensive Q&A. So. No, no questions for me. Okay. Thank you. No, so far right, it's, thank you. it's clear. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So as procurement is decentralized at the city, of course, you know, it really will take a village to roll out a high performing program. And as defined in the action plan, this initiative will really be stewarded and championed by environment and sustainability in collaboration with finance. And, you know, those groups will ensure that city department staff have the tools and support and, you know, subject matter expertise needed to implement sustainability in the procurements uh, that they are the owners of. So those city department staff really are the doers here, uh, you know, and they'll be responsible for evaluating the sustainability risks and opportunities for a given procurement or project, and then integrating those relevant criteria wherever possible. And finally here, you know, it will be incredibly important for city council to support the alignment of this program with existing city priorities and commitments and uphold those um, in council level decision making. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we had the program framework on the slide, this chart really represents how the city will progress in maturity across those 10 best practice elements over the next five years. And so as you can see there in the first row, um, the city already has several program areas that are well on their way to being you know, well developed as our project uh, with Reef Consulting and the city comes to an end. And year one of program activity will begin starting on April 1st of this uh, this year. And so, you know, with some various milestones at the ends of year one and year three, the goal ultimately is for the city to have evolved to full maturity or best practice uh, in all 10 program areas as indicated by the full moons at the end of year five. And so I'll just add right here as well that the moon chart evaluation process is based on a set of standardized criteria uh, for what constitutes an open moon, a quarter moon, a half moon, and so on. And so Charlottetown does have that criteria on file, uh, and they'll use that to measure progress in these areas over the coming years. So with year one coming into focus, uh, the city has identified seven key priority elements to focus on advancing maturity. And so the first there is staffing and resources. And so, you know, securing some funding to resource the program, either internally or externally, will really be essential to support its development and success over time. On policy, the priorities to obtain approval of the procurement bylaw integrated with sustainability considerations, which will really provide a foundational backbone for the work that the city will be doing on this. Training and communications will be advanced through the development of a training and communications plan uh, and subsequent implementation of planned uh, engagement activities. Standardized procurement procedures uh, at various thresholds of spend will be developed over the course of year one. 
on the HIPPO uh, program element there, activation of those pre-identified areas on Charlottetown's HIPPO list, uh, which was a deliverable that we created in this phase of work. That will begin in year one uh, with you know one or more HIPPOs being implemented within each quarter dependent on contract timelines. And then the tools uh, that have also been developed in this current phase of work uh, with the city will be rolled out and officially piloted with uh, city department staff involved in procurements, especially those involved in those HIPPOs. Uh, and then the tools will be refined as needed uh, based on internal feedback. And then finally, of course, uh, the city will establish some methods for collecting and tracking the key performance indicators that have been defined in the action plan uh, and publish success stories, uh, of course, wherever possible. So in terms of measuring success, uh, we do look at key performance indicators in three facets. And so the first being actually program KPIs. And so that really refers back to that moon chart maturity progression uh, chart that we had showed on the screen earlier. Uh, and the second type of KPI are these activity KPIs that we have on the screen here. So these really measure how Charlottetown is actively using sustainability criteria to impact its procurement decisions. And these KPIs are often used during the early stages of a program. And so it's definitely common practice to focus on these in the first year of implementation, for example. And so uh, in the action plan, you'll see that Charlottetown has identified three desired activity KPIs. Uh, the first being the number, percentage, or dollar value of bids issued with environmental criteria. Uh, second, the average weighting applied to sustainability criteria. And third, the number of staff uh, trained on the procurement bylaw, sustainable procurement tools, and procedures. And the third type of KPI uh, is impact, measuring the environmental and social impacts that result from incorporating more sustainability considerations into procurements. And so these really measure, you know, the extent to which the use of sustainability criteria in the selection of products and vendors results in improved outcomes. And so these KPIs are often, you know, more challenging to track and may require uh, certain infrastructure procedures to accurately measure. And in the action plan, Charlottetown has identified six desired uh, impact KPIs to track towards over the course of five years. And so these will really aim to first measure the cost of sustainable versus conventional contracts, the number of contracts awarded or percent spend towards products with eco logos or certifications, the percent reduction of greenhouse gas emissions as a result of criteria, the number of or dollar value percentage spend spent with local suppliers and similarly diverse suppliers, uh, as well as the number of suppliers with their own corporate sustainability strategies or policies. And so, you know, these program activity and impact KPIs called out in the action plan really define how the city will measure success over time with sustainable procurement. And so that wraps up our mile a minute overview um, of Charlottetown's sustainable procurement strategy and action plan. And like I said before, uh, we will have lots of time at the end um, of the presentation for some Q&A. But before we dive into this uh, budget implications section, which Amanda will be leading, uh, I will pause here again if there's any immediate questions. Anybody have any questions? No. No, not so, for me. Okay. Uh, Marion, I just have one. Um, sure. Your strategy and action plan, and you, you, you will go back to page 12 on, on your moon cycle. Um, am I to take from that that it will be the end of 2024 before we have a, an action plan in place, or are you going to have most of it in place by March of this year? So, uh, Amanda, you can jump in as well as the expert with the CCSP criteria. But um, yeah, so the action plan, the strategy and action plan will be fully developed um, by the end of our, uh, I guess, phase of work and hopefully approved today, uh, this uh, committee and council meeting. And so um, what constitutes a full moon is that the action plan has been approved for a certain period of time and that activities have begun taking place. So the plan itself is completely fully developed uh, okay. as of today. So okay. uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, and, and the staffing, staffing private, is there, is there, Katrina, I know you're the lead on this. Is, is there talk about hiring more people for the sustainability, this part of the program? Do we have a number? 
Do we know what we're going to, our needs are or will be? Do, I can speak to that if you want, Marin. Um, sure, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, so I'm working with Betty right now on the budget request for this year. I think the number that we have put in right now kind of for the whole project and the staffing is around 80,000. We are seeking some funding support on that, but yeah, at the moment okay. that's where we're at. Okay, yep, thank you. Excellent, thank you. All right, um, Amanda, I'll hand off to you. Sure, thanks, Marin. So we thought we'd spend a bit of time today discussing the considerations to keep in mind about the cost benefit and budget implications of sustainable procurement, especially around using a best value view on purchasing and using total cost of ownership approach um, in some cases to help find life cycle cost savings. So in the last decade or so, public procurement has really been seeing an evolution, um, moving from a lowest price approach always to looking more at a best value approach and considering really what is included in the definition of value. And so sustainable procurement is not just, you know, choosing the greenest or most socially responsible option despite cost and quality, but rather it's about integrating your organization's sustainability priorities into your definition of what is best value and aiming to gain kind of the most optimal combination of the factors that you see here on screen. And so best value really does reflect the core definition of sustainable procurement being around purchasing more sustainable products from more sustainable suppliers alongside the consideration of all of these traditional factors like that we always evaluate on like price and quality and service. And so sustainability doesn't ever override these other factors, but it's considered in combination with. And for any given procurement, these factors might all be weighted differently. We've seen sustainability criteria range from being, you know, 5% all the way to upwards of 30% of an evaluation score for a procurement. Um, and so something I'll mention here as well is that, you know, incorporating sustainability into procurement isn't meant to be an entirely new process, um, but rather just an enhancement to the procurement process that further enables your organization to meet its high level strategic objectives, as Marin was chatting about. And so Charlottetown has the opportunity now to incrementally start introducing more sustainability considerations into procurements and with this action plan is building a program that will support staff in the necessary training, um, providing them tools and resources to help make those decisions in their purchasing um, practices. So can I just ask a question right there? Yeah, totally. Before we go too far, I'm just wondering, um, with our procurement policy, so I, if I understand that right, what you're saying is when we do out when 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 the city does have a tender, they can mm -hmm. add the sustainability component to that tender to make it For comply sure. to the procurement policy. Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah. Um, perfect. All right. So now I'm going to talk about um, total cost of ownership or TCO, uh, which is a method that supports taking a best value approach. And so there's often an assumption that, you know, more sustainable options can cost more, um, you know, and sometimes this can be the case. But, you know, often they are becoming more and more cost competitive upfront, especially in more mature markets where sustainability options, you know, have existed for quite a while. Um, and definitely can be more competitive when comparing long-term costs. And so that's what TCO is all about. It's designed to kind of assess the true cost of an investment by considering the time horizon of the full life cycle of a product um, or a service. And so it's a way for project managers kind of in the planning stage to plan for and identify the accumulated costs of a purchase price, you know, up front, plus the indirect costs that are found, you know, associated with the product usage, like energy and water utilities, um, or, you know, additional repair and maintenance, maintenance costs like labor and cleaning and upkeep, um, or even, you know, storage and disposal costs like um, solid waste disposal or waste hauling, um, as well as other, you know, social or environmental risks or liabilities, because, you know, a lot of these indirect costs can uh, indirectly 
impact the environment or the community and create costs in that way, such as, you know, leading to increased greenhouse gas emissions or pollution or filling up our landfill or even something like missing the opportunity to provide some local employment, um, you know, which all translate into cost for society and are all things that we know, you know, a city like Charlottetown is, um, you know, very uh, has deemed important to them. So, you know, all in all, TCO is a strategy enables alternatives uh, to be compared and identify, you know, a most cost effective option over an item's lifetime um, beyond just the initial ticket price. And so taking this approach can help achieve best value um, over a purchase's life cycle, um, ultimately resulting in, you know, an efficient use of public resources and also creating room to quantify things that might not be traditionally accounted for um, within the procurement department, but that still impact the city's bottom line at the end of the day. And so here we just want to go over four things to keep in mind when trying to tackle, you know, the potential budget implications of sustainable procurement as there's really no one size fits all solution to figure out exactly how sustainability will impact budgets. Um, but I do want to say, you know, firstly, it will all be very case by case, um, depending on what is being purchased. You know, a more sustainable option could cost a little more upfront, or it could be very cost comparable. Um, you know, if there's a product category where sustainability has been identified to be included, like one of our hippo categories, um, project managers could always do a bit of upfront market research or even distribute a request for information. Um, to suppliers to indicate how much of the offering might cost considering these additional sustainability criteria. And then that can then be incorporated into budget planning for the next year. Uh, secondly, it's important to note that, you know, total cost of ownership won't necessarily be used for every procurement. Um, you know, it is a an extra step in the process, if you will. And so even when it is used, you know, that level of effort will range depending on the amount of time or availability or, you know, complexity of the procurement. Um, and also that every evaluation of TCO might look slightly different because it's up to the individual, um, you know, client uh, business unit staff if a TCO evaluation would be valuable um, and then to decide, you know, what factor would be included in that. Um, thirdly, is simply to remember the fact that when considering life cycle costs, there can often be cost savings found um, rather than looking at upfront price alone. Um, you know, just as a quick example, if you're looking for a more, you know, a more durable product that lasts longer, maybe it costs a little bit more upfront, but say it lasts for seven years instead of five years compared to a lower cost option. So that means that you actually save a lot of costs in repair or even needing to entirely replace that item, you know, for a few more years. Um, and finally, what I'll say is, you know, using TCO or the concept of best value um, really brings in the consideration of environmental and social priorities that the city has into your purchasing decision making and, um, you know, supports the definition of, you know, what the city values. Um, and so we'll just go through a really quick example, really quick, just to showcase, you know, cost savings from another jurisdiction. This was from the city of Ottawa, um, where they employed a TCO model to uh, their procurement of four um, electric boilers to replace some conventional gas boilers in several of the city's recreation facilities. And so they went through this um, analysis of cost, but also of greenhouse gas emissions. And so even though, you know, electric options do cost a little more than the gas powered up front by evaluating the total cost and energy savings over their lifetime. Um, as noted there on the screen, um, uh, the city was able to successfully justify this purchase um, and, you know, align the purchase with their top level sustainability strategies as well, like reducing um, greenhouse gases. Um, so I think the last thing we have here before we get into more Q&A is around, you know, benefits. And so when sustainable procurement is done well, when we have all elements of a program kind of uh, working uh, their way to maturity, you know, there really are an abundance of benefits that organizations can um, achieve. And so working kind of from the uh, the top uh, round clockwise here. So 
achieving more strategic relationships, um, you know, through using sustainability as another way or as another reason to engage with your existing suppliers or those in the broader community helps develop closer relationships with your local businesses. And, you know, this allows also for the identification of opportunities to improve and better serve the city's needs. There's also a public perception piece for the community. Um, you know, working on sustainable procurement and celebrating those wins is another way to communicate to your residents that, you know, the city's action is actioning um, on your commitments to sustainability and your other plans like your climate action plan. Um, there's financial return on investment. You know, we just spoke a bit about that with total cost of ownership and finding life cycle costing savings, um, which can be had over the lifetime of, of a project based on um, getting products that are more efficient, you know, resource efficiency, or they have reduced maintenance costs or reduced disposal costs, things like that. Um, there's also risk reduction. Uh, you know, we learned over the last couple of years, supply chains can be vulnerable sometimes. And so by taking a closer look at the impacts of the purchases we have and building those relationships with your suppliers, there's more opportunity to identify and potentially mitigate, you know, environmental or other um, even ethical supply chain risks. Uh, you know, there's also benefits for your employees. We know that a lot of folks these days value sustainability, they value um, the environment. And so sustainable procurement is another way that the city can um, engage employees with aligned values and also, you know, can play a role in attracting and retention um, of talent. Um, and last thing I'll say here is market development. You know, you're a buying organization and you can create demand in the market. And so by incorporating sustainability criteria into your purchasing, this really signals to suppliers and creates demand for more sustainable options in the market, which ultimately serves everyone, you know, including not only yourself, but other buying institutions and, and kind of society at large, you know, as we make more progress towards green, circular and an inclusive economy. So with that, I'll hand it back to Mary. Excellent. Thank you, Amanda. That was a great rundown of, you know, those potential budget implications, but of course, as well, those those really, really tangible benefits. So, um, yeah, I guess the floor is open now for some general Q&A on the first half of the presentation around the strategy and action plan, as well as um, the budget implications and best value total cost of ownership uh, that was Amanda was just discussing. No, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I don't know, does anybody have any questions on any of that presentation? Bob, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I don't, Terry, but thank oh. you. It was a great presentation. Everybody good? Mr. Yeah. Chair, I do have a few questions. Uh, I think uh, the mayor has some questions here. I just want to go back, Katrina, to 2.2 year one work plan. Uh, the timelines, April, June 2023, July, September 2023. Facilitate successful approval of a, of a procurement bylaw with sustainability integrated by city council. So that I believe Sue has to, if I, if you don't mind me asking, because the process I think it goes through finance as a procurement <clears throat> issue with a bylaw is at, initiated at the at the finance. So it'll have to go through that standing committee. Then if Katrina, if you look at 2.3 years. Uh, 2.5 road or two, hy two hyphen roadmap. Again, it talks about the um, need to have a, uh, a procurement monitor and progress compliance of procurement bylaw year two, year three. And Mr. Chair, so that has to be done first, is put this bylaw in place. So we're looking at moving this forward as we go through our procurement bylaw process. Is that right, Katrina? I think so, but can you just clarify what do you mean by doing the bylaw first? Well, we, we only have a procurement by, a policy. Right. Yeah. By the, under the Municipal Government Act, mm -hmm. we should have had a procurement bylaw in place some years, uh, yes. well, a couple of few years ago. So we're, we're going, th there is a, a template in place yes. to move that forward. So I just want to make sure that what we approve today or what we move Move forward. Yeah, I don't. I don't think this is going to affect that. I mean, you're right. We have a procurement policy. I, th I think uh, uh, my understanding of some of this presentation was how we implement some of the sustainability products we want to purchase. Right. 
or implemented within our policy yeah. or bylaw. Well, I, so I think we're, we're switching from a policy to a bylaw. Yeah. So and I think we need, Mr. Chair, I think that policy, policy transferring or going towards a uh, bylaw is very important because that bylaw will uh, define how we procure uh, services, goods, and so forth, and but using, it does so using this as an environmental lenses. It does so now. I think what, what this is all about uh, is, is looking for more whenever we do go to tender on services or, or products or assets that we have a sustainability lens yeah. included in it. Oh, no. I, I, Mr. Chair, I hope the bylaw is much stronger than the policy that we have in place because there are some issues that we have to address in that bylaw. But we Mr. did pass a resolution that we were looking to go towards sustainability procurement. Yeah. So uh, looking at page 18, Katrina, uh, Katrina, total cost of ownership, purchase, delivery, install, training. You said that you're going to require another 80000 in the budget. Is that right, Jessica, Katrina? Uh, it's right now we've been discussing where it best fits. So at the yeah. moment it's sitting in finances operational budget. We have a, a small amount in the ENS budget, but mostly um, Betty has it in hers and we have at the moment budgeted 80,000. So, so Mr. Chair, the reason I ask because this training operation maintenance overseeing anything that we do for procurement using that environmental lenses someone will have to be checking out the boxes, correct? Yeah, so the idea being that most of these actual actions don't cost money, but we need somebody who's responsible for them being implemented. Yeah, to and that's ensure why that we've taken following that approach. what we want to do in yeah. terms of reducing our carbon footprint as an example. And if I can just go to Mr. Chair, this is the last question. Considerations for TCO, case-by-case -case basis. It's the next page, page 19. Life cycle costs versus capital upfront cost. Anytime you look at doing something that is socially, economically responsible, environmentally responsible, culturally responsible, there's always an added cost. And that upfront cost, I know, can be, for some, let's just look at a cheaper product, but that's where this environmental lenses will say, no, the, the longer term effect will be reduce carbon footprint, uh, contribute to a more sustainable environment. Is that correct, Katrina? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to note, too, that um, although sometimes there's an increased upfront cost, that's not always the case. Um, and it's important to be looking at um, both that upfront cost and where sometimes it's actually just the same price um, and then those longer term effects where um, we can justify those purchases. And I, and I think just to add to that, and I understand what you're saying, and I understand what you're saying, because sometimes there's quite a difference in cost, and yeah. the council will have to decide if they want to go that route. But just, uh, you know, reading not too long ago, there was a police station in the States who went through and bought all new police cars. They're all Tesla electric vehicles. The amount of their budget for fuel alone, let alone repairs, um, even though these vehicles were expensive to purchase off, off the get-go, they're saving a lot more money for the, from expenses from gas and from repairs and oil changes and so on uh, from these electric vehicles. So they have a fleet of police vehicles that are all electric. So just, just to give you an example, there's, there's a higher cost to start, but as, 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 the, uh, as the presentation showed, sometimes if you, if you walk it through, you'll see that at the end of a five-year period, the end of a three-year period, whatever that is, you're actually ahead, which is better for the city and for the taxpayers. Well, That's uh, uh, Mr. Chair, you know firsthand, this past Saturday, five of us went down to uh, St. Peter's using the two electric cars. There were no charges for any of us for uh, uh, kilometers, uh, charge, what is it, uh, your mileage? No one submitted a mileage uh, uh, claim because we all used the, all of us were in the two electric cars. So there's a saving, small as it is, but it does add up. But I do want to thank Marion and Amanda, great presentation. Thank you, Katrina, great idea. Jessica and others, merci beaucoup. Thank you, Marion and Amanda. Uh, there's nobody else with thank any you. questions? Simon, you're okay? Trevor, you're good? Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. We look forward to uh, speaking to you in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. Um, and just before we move on, um, there is a recommendation to formally adopt um, the action plan that was presented today between the Finance and Environment and Sustainability Committees and forward it on to Council. Um, do council feel comfortable that you've, uh, have you guys read this and digested it? Are you okay? Or do you want some time to digest it before we make a recommendation? Are you guys good? It 
she answered all my questions, I guess. Like she was very clear on that. When you say recommendation, is th what's the cost that would be involved with this? Is there any cost? Like for well, I think the, one, it's eighty thousand dollars going into the budget. Um, do we really know the cost? Depends on the depends on what we're purchasing. Really, yeah, no, each, each procurement will be separate, but just that's for right. their, their and services. And I think that's why she said it's, it's case by case okay. basis. Yeah. Oh, sorry, just to clarify that there. So their services were actually paid for predominantly um, by a grant from FCM that we received um, a year or so ago, and that that money has already been spent, and we're kind of wrapping up that project. So we're proposing based on their recommendations that there'd be eighty thousand in the budget, but then everything else would be on a case by case basis. It just okay. I'm good for go. I'm good to move on, Mr. With Chair. That. Just a point of order. It's it's her last sentence. City staff recommend that the environmental and sustainability and finance committees. So we're given approval through this committee. Then it has to go to finance. No, uh, no. That's why we've invited finance to be here today. But he's the chair. He, he he's one member of of a standing committee. It has to go to finance. Councillor Durant is also on finance, and Julie was. Uh, to be in attendance as well. So both committees were going to be in attendance today. Okay. I will say that somebody should have told me that. Yeah, that's a good I point. That. So, uh, uh, anyway. Mr. Chair, I would prefer that it goes to uh, uh, the finance committee so that we can have a, a discussion about the financial implications. Uh, that's my view, Mr. Chair. I, and, I, and I agree. I think it should go there. But I think the I think question right now is, is our committee comfortable sending it to finance? Green yeah. light. Okay. Bobby, you okay? Green light. Yeah, and, send it to finance so we can look at it. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I guess just, Mr. Chair, if I could, I, as, as finance uh, chair, just cons what I'm hearing is this will be a request that'll be coming to finance for capital budget for 80k. Is that? Well, no, not not really. I mean, that's, that's okay. part of the package. I think I think this the, the procurement, this whole program, is going to finance. To see if finance also agrees that we start implementing this within our tenders at GoEV. And tenders is under finance. So you guys can have this discussion again. It was good to have, I think the idea of having the finance committee here was to be able to review this uh, presentation with finance. Uh, so just you here and Bob and, and Julie missed, I mean, um, you have the presentation in front of you. You guys can discuss it at finance. We're recommending that it goes to finance. We're recommending that it is, does become part of our procurement policy. Make sense? Okay. Can I have a mover and a seconder to send it to, towards I'm finance? Moved by Trevor. Second by His Worship. Okay. That will move on to finance. Make sense? Go just ahead, a, just a point to that, Mr. Chair. Uh, as part of our normal budget process, anything related to a new initiative would be advanced through the lead department on a new initiative summary yeah. as part of their budget submission to council, which obviously goes through finance. Yeah. So I don't think we're creating any new layers here. I think it's a matter of Jessica as the department lead, making sure this plan gets represented in the new initiative with the cost implications and it'll go through the normal process. Yeah, and I think that's really all we're saying. It, this would normally go to finance and they, because they have the jurisdiction to make that decision. So I think. And Mr. Chair, I believe it is a operational, not capital. And again, that procurement bylaw is very important as part of this plan going forward. That has to be in place. Thank you. Okay, so we have a mover and seconder. All in favor? Yes. Okay, move on. Uh, next is the UPI Climate Lab project. Really interested to see on this one. Do we have uh, Simon as a shield? No, no. This would be uh, me. Um, Sorry, Alistair. I think there's a few people I don't recognize, so for their sake, um, I'm Alistair Ozon, the water coordinator um, with the sustainability department. I also do a bit of work with the water and sewer utility. Um, so this report here is just an update on a project that we started back in the um, winter after Hurricane Fiona. We we're interested in finding different ways we could um, assess the damage done to our natural assets across the city. So we did um, have some initial meetings with UPEI and came into an agreement um, for them to do some work where they're going to, um, with the da database they have access to, take satellite imagery they have before the uh, hurricane and then compare that to um, some imagery from after the hurricane. And on top of that, they're, they have um, done some drone flights on the areas we have selected. And those areas are 
I think it's four forested areas, the first one being Victoria Park, uh, the Acadian Forest area in East Royalty, and then two sections, one of um, Ellens Creek and one of Wrights Creek, which are both um, at least partially city owned. And then we also were interested in coastal erosion as part of this project. So we selected two areas of coastline, one in, Qu in Queen Elizabeth Park where erosion is a known issue and the other is on Merchantson Lane down by the QEH. And that's where we had the living shoreline installation done in 2000, um, 2021 rather. Um, so those are the areas we're interested in. Um, right now we haven't received any of the, we've only received like an example of the work they're gonna be doing with that satellite imagery. But by the end of the fiscal year, they will be providing a detailed report on that, um, looking at all these areas and the impact. And the idea being that getting a better idea of how these forests and shorelines have been affected, we could better improve our forestry management practices and use that information in kind of a, some of the projects we have planned for the next fiscal year. And I guess the, the total for this was um, $14,000 coming from the ENS operating budget that was set aside for um, natural asset work. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Sure, yep. So, Alistair, this past weekend, this past Saturday, like Simon, we were down at the St. Peter's Institute of Climate Change Adaptation Facility. We were at the, in the lab, saw the drones they're using. I, I thought I saw imagery already off these areas that you're talking about in your Ellens Creek, Wrights Creek. Did they, they already do that? Yes, yeah, so all the uh, drone flights were done back in, I think, early December. They were yeah. able to get them all done before there was snow on the ground. So it's possible they had those all prepared. Um, yeah. So the 14,000 is for work already completed? Uh, so that it, the work hasn't all been completed. Uh, the Climate Lab is currently working on the assessment, so it'll take some time to run through all of the data. It's a lot of, I think, um, processing and work on a computer, so it just takes some time for the, I think they have at least one master's student working on it, and then that'll all go into a report, but for all of the uh, drone flights, those are complete. Yeah, so Mr. Chair, I'm just trying to find out, so what's the assessment? I, you got the imagery, and now with the imagery, we're gonna take the, the, the scientist at the Climate uh, Institute of Climate Change and Adapt Adaptation will take that information and will they provide assessment of what really happened from a, a Hurricane Fiona and then how are we going to get ready for Hurricane Fiona 2, 3, 4? Is that, is that part of the plan? I don't believe, uh, I don't believe the um, recommendations for you know, preparing for future events are part of, the pro part of this report, um, but that's kind of for us to take take on as staff, look at it, see which areas of these natural um, areas were affected more than others, see if there's any correlation between maybe species, age of the trees, anything like that that might uh, assist in that and kind of go from there. We are also looking at having a couple students from the wildlife conservation technology do some of their on the job training work with us in April and we were thinking as part of their work plan, they could do some on the ground assessments to follow up and better uh, flesh out these reports. And again, um, that'll all go towards um, the urban forestry team's decisions and um, our asset management, natural asset management decisions as a whole. So Mr. Chair, just this is the last question on this. So we know the winds were from the north east and the northwest kept going back and forth during Hurricane Fiona. So if they were coming from the south, southeast, southwest, that would hit directly on our shorefront, will they be looking at, you know, possibilities of wind direction from the south, the to due west, due east? Like, I, I'm, I, I know the imagery's done because I saw it. I'm just wondering, the 14,000, it's not, again, it's, I know it's, 
it's not substantial, but I'm just trying to find out what are we getting from it other than the imageries? Like, are we getting more information that provides getting ready for the next Fiona 2, Fiona 3? I'll just jump in to add to what Alistair said. So the 14,000 we contributed towards those drone flights. So they flew those city uh, sites on our behalf. So that was part of it. And so um, really diving into those specific sites, Alistair mentioned is what we wanted to, so like the before and after, what did this parkland or natural area look like before the storm? What did it look like after the storm? Where are the pockets that are most impacted? So then our team can go and do further assessments, decide on restoration work and planning. So it's not really um, diving into um, future planning for other sites. It's really just diving into those five sites, flying them, getting imagery, and looking at impacts. Well, Jessica, Hurricane Juan in 2003 came from the south and we saw the damage to Victoria Park. Uh, I think Councillor Bernard was chair of Parks and Recreation. We were, were both in council. So we know if the winds shift, it's gonna, the, the area it's gonna affect is the, what's closest to it. So anyways, I, I, I just wanted to say that I saw the imagery. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering though, just, where, where about is that in the budget? Your 14,000 to talk about? This is in our last fiscal budget, okay, or so you, sorry, current fiscal budget, not the one we're discussing today. So you don't have any for this year? I, or is it under shoreline protection? Yeah, no, I don't think we have more in this. Do we, Alistair? Because we have 100 Did we 000. ask for more budget for to extend that into next fiscal? I don't think so. We do have some lines for like natural asset uh, management work and that we had applied for a grant through FCM and we were hoping to have that um, supplement that funding, but uh, it kind of ran out of funding this year, so we are waiting to see if that fund's gonna get more um, allocation to it, and if so, that'll help support this work moving forward, but we haven't, we're kind of waiting to see what this report will look sure. like okay. before we make any, um, any decisions in which direction we wanna go, whether that's working more I with the Climate now. Lab or another okay. group. Perfect, yeah, all right, thank you. Bob, you got any questions? No, I'm good, Terry. Thank you. Anybody else? Everybody good? Okay. Thank you very much, Alistair and Jessica. Um, now, motion to move into closed session is per section 1191E of the Municipal Government Act. Uh, financial material still under consideration. A mover and a seconder. Trevor? Bobby, you, you good? Yeah, sure. We're going to discuss okay. some. Uh, uh, motion to move budget. into closed session. Fast.